John 16, 5. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak of His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of Mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore I said that He takes of Mine and will disclose it to you. This is the Word of the Living God. And the words of Jesus in uh, the text that we just read, they come, as you might remember, immediately after His warning to the apostles that they would be persecuted on account of the Gospel. He told them that they would be made outcasts and even killed for their testimony. We saw that last week, and now we are going to go over the text that follows that ominous prediction. Now at this point, you might think that Christ would give His apostles a, a few pointers on how to avoid all this persecution that He just spoke about. He could have taught them on how to soften their message without really losing it. He could have uh, taught them how to take the edge off, how to make it less offensive, how to make it more palatable to the culture around them that they were in. After all, they were in a society at this point that hated divine truth. So they might, be, they might have been spared in many ways if they just toned down their preaching just a little bit. And some evangelical leaders would actually do that kind of thing today. They would advise other preachers to be less offensive. They would tell you how to be a little bit less offensive in your preaching of the gospel. After all, uh, why talk so much about sin and judgment? Why uh, not focus instead on the love of God? Why expose yourself and, and, uh, to, to the anger of the mob and, and, and call out certain sins? The ones that our culture loves. Why, why call those sins out? Why talk about sodomy, transgenderism? Why condemn things that offend people so much when they have Bibles in their own houses and they could just read about that in their own privacy? Why be so offensive? Why risk enraging them? They would speak that way. You can find plenty of respectable, soft-spoken, experienced men who would tell you that kind of thing. But to be sure, the Lord Jesus would not be in their company. He would not be among them. He would not be part of their council. Because rather than following His warning about persecution with a speech on how they could avoid it, instead what He does is He tells them why their testimony is worth suffering for. He tells them about the worthiness of our witness. He taught them that the gospel, the message of Christianity, our witness is worth suffering all things for. First of all, because it is a triumphant message. It is a triumphant message. Look at verses 5 and 7. It says, but now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I said these things, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper, the helper would not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The expression, uh, the one who sent me here at, at uh, the top of verse 5, that refers, of course, to the Father. In verse uh, 28, Christ will say that explicitly. Verse 28 says of uh, chapter 16, I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. The Father is the one who sent the Son. And our Lord liked referring, He loved to refer to uh, the Father in those terms as the one who sent Him. And that is because He wanted to remind constantly uh, His hearers that their salvation had act actually started in the very heart of the Father. We often think of God the Father as cold and distant and removed and unloving and too uh, holy to even have anything to do uh, with, with sinful creatures and that He actually even needs a mediator to begin to love us. But actually, He Himself is the genesis. He is the beginning of our own salvation. He sent His Son while we were yet sinners. The Gospel begins with Him. And this is why John says in 1 John 5, 1, 8, God is love. Or 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And Christ was reminding the disciples here of that. He says, but now I am going to him who sent me. He is going back to the Father where it all began. And that is, of course, very significant. When he talks about returning to the Father, he means that he is going to be exalted. He is going to be shown to be that Lord of David, the one who, whom David spoke of, who sits at the right hand of the Father until all of his enemies are made a footstool for his feet by Yahweh himself, by God the Father. Psalm 110 verse 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, God the Father says to God the Son, My Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So Jesus of Nazareth here, he was claiming to be David's Lord, the Messiah. And the Jews, of course, had denied that throughout his own ministry. They had persecuted him even for claiming to be that Messiah. To them, he was nothing more than the, jo the son of Joseph, the carpenter. To them, he was nothing but a man from some obscure and insignificant corner of the nation. He was despised. There was no majesty. There was no splendor that he had. Nothing outwardly attractive about him to bring people to himself. But the time was coming in which he would be lifted up. The time was coming in which he would be exalted to the right hand of the Father. His divine glory was finally going to be unveiled. And yet, the disciples are not thinking about that here. Verse 5 again, now I'm going to him who sent me. I am going to be exalted. And none of you ask me, where are you going? This is an interesting statement, by the way, because back in uh, chapter 13, verse 36, Peter literally asked Jesus where he was going. Uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 36, as uh, Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. And Thomas, even Thomas himself, asked a similar question in chapter 14, verse 5. It says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? So, so both Peter and Thomas actually had asked the question. So why did the Lord in this passage said, none of you ask me, where are you going? Why, why is he saying that? What does he mean by that? And the answer actually is very simple. And neither Peter nor Thomas pressed the issue. None of you keeps asking me, where are you going? They weren't trying hard enough. They were not asking what kind of glory he was going to go enjoy where he was going. They were not asking what kind of happiness they themselves were going to inherit because of Jesus Christ. No, but rather the, their focus throughout this uh, discourse had been on themselves. They were so sorrowful about losing Christ's bodily presence, about Christ leaving them in bodily fashion, uh, and the prospect even of persecution and death that they had forgotten to set their minds on what would be the result of all of that pain and all of that suffering. What would come after the cross? 
And the Lord pointed that out in verse 6. He says, but because I said to you, these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. To, to fill obviously means to make full here or to cause to abound. So their hearts were overwhelmed with grief and sorrow. There was no, no room, as it were, in those hearts for any hope. They had not allowed uh, any space in their own hearts for spiritual realities, for thinking of what is ahead, for thinking of what comes because of Jesus' sufferings and their own sufferings. You see, grief can do that to you, right? Grief can actually cloud your spiritual wisdom, excessive, or your spiritual vision. Excessive grief can do that. That's what happened to Jacob. You might remember uh, when he thought he lost his son Joseph. It says in Genesis 37, 35, he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. All he wanted in his pain was to die. And he could not think of anything else, let alone heavenly realities. And the 11 sons that he did have, and the covenant that God was going to keep to give him a land and to make him a people. He wasn't thinking about any of those things. He just wanted to die in his grief. It's the, um, the opposite of what you find in the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah is in the midst of the most horrendous thing that you can imagine. The raising of Jerusalem, the raping of women, the killing of men. The most horrendous Situation you can find yourself in, so much so that it was called the day of Yahweh. And yet, here's what he says in Lamentations 3, 20 and 21. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because the Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your what? Faith. Your faithfulness. He knew God is faithful, and I cannot see it right now in all of this pain and suffering, but He is there, and He is faithful. So Jeremiah, he didn't allow sorrow to ever overwhelm him to the point of hopelessness. He kept his eyes up to the hills, and he looked for God's goodness there up in the mountains. But the apostles, they were not like that, not at this point. Not at this point, no, they were overwhelmed with grief, and the Lord was showing that to them. And he, he did that to help them. He wanted to help them. He pointed out to them what important truths they were overlooking in their own distress. Look at verse 7, it says, But I tell you the truth, uh, I tell you the truth, this is an oath that he's making here, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. How, how kind and, and patient Christ is as a teacher. Let me help you see this. You're missing something. It, it is to your advantage that this is happening, that I am leaving. The helper, of course, is the Holy Spirit. He, he, he helps in this situation. He helps by coming to testify about Jesus Christ, about His deity, about His power to save he comes to make his gospel go forth into the world. But Jesus, as he, as, as he says here, as Jesus said here, that was not going to happen until the ascension. You say, why? Why couldn't Jesus simply just send the Holy Spirit while he was still on earth? Why did he have to wait until he was exalted? And uh, to that, I, I simply say that that was not the plan of God. God had decreed that the Messiah should first be put to death and resurrected and enthroned and that then He would send out His Spirit. And He had promised it that way. Uh, he promised that the Spirit would come after the ascension of the Messiah. We read that this morning in Psalm 68 verse 18. You can look at that real quick with me. Psalm 68 18. says, you have, you have ascended on high, you have led captive your captives, you have received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. 
So notice, again, the, the ascension comes first. You have ascended on high. And he does that to lead his captives captive. That could be a reference to the enemies of the Lord who were defeated at the cross and even to death and the grave, which could not hold him down. He was leading us, we've also translated this term, captivity itself captive. Death was going up to him. He had defeated death. And in so doing, in his ascension, he is also giving, at that point, gifts among men. Or it says, in fact, in, here in, in Psalm 68, that he was receiving gifts. Those gifts uh, would be, of course, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which qualify men for the ministry of the gospel. If you have a spiritual gift, that is a gift that Christ himself received when he ascended. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 4.11. It says that he received those gifts in his human nature so that he might be able to give them to his people. As a man, he received all of the gifts of the Spirit. He received the, gift, the, 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 the Spirit himself so that he might be able to pour him out to his church. And again, all of this happened at Pentecost when he sent his Spirit and so the message that the Spirit comes to testify about is a message of a triumphant, ascended, exalted Messiah. It's a message of victory. Christ rose from the grave. It was only after He had taken captivity captive. It was only after He had gone up back to the Father, having accomplished His mission, that the Spirit came and that this message came, which means that this is a message of success and triumph and life. It is the opposite of what you find in our culture. In our culture, the, the prevailing message is, eat, drink, be merry, for to, tomorrow we die. There is nothing to look forward to but today. And that, at face value, seems like a rather cheerful message, that I can just free, give free reign to all of my lusts and all of my evil desires. I get to live the way that I want and just let it go. It seems cheerful at first, but we know that it's appointed unto man wants to die. And then comes the judgment. And every sinner dies. The wages of sin is death. Every person dies. And so... This is a hopeless message. Because in the end, at the end of the line, there is only death and judgment and destruction. But our gospel is triumphant. Our gospel is a message of eternal life and victory over sin. It's a message of success. Now beyond being triumphant, our gospel is spiritual. It's spiritual. It's a spiritual witness, and by that I mean that it, it, is, it proceeds from the Spirit of God Himself. Look at verses 8 through 10 of our passage. It says, And He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. The verb that is uh, translated here as to convict is sometimes uh, translated as to rebuke. But it actually means more than just a rebuke because this is a, a specific kind of rebuking. It's a, it's a rebuking, a bringing a charge of an, or, or an accusation against someone that is actually successful. I mean, think about it. You might... Accuse someone of something without convincing him of his fault. Uh, or or you, might, you might not succeed in convincing or convicting that person that the charge you brought against him is valid. For example, uh, Peter is said to have rebuked the Lord Jesus Christ. You might remember he took him aside after Jesus said that he was going to die. and He took him aside and rebuked him. Now, Peter did not convict him. He rebuked him, but he did not convict him because Jesus was not guilty of anything. And so the charge did not stick. So for there to be a conviction 
beyond a rebuke for there to be a conviction. The wrongdoer has to feel and know that he is guilty. He has to know his fault. And Jesus was promising here that this spirit would do that to the world. That he would convict, bring a successful charge against the world. The world, of course, is the present evil system dominated by Satan. But the world here specifically that the Lord has in mind, I believe, is the world, the, relig the, the Jewish religious world. The religious establishment of Israel. They had rejected the Lord. They were the world. They were successful men at the top of the chain. They were at the top of the religious industry. And they had rejected Christ. But the Spirit, He was coming to convict them, to bring a successful charge against them concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Uh, the, the word sin means, as we know, to miss the mark. To miss the mark. This is why Romans 6.23 says, For all have sinned and what? Fall short of the glory of... They all miss the mark of the glory of God. So, sinning is falling short of the divine standard. It's a wandering away from the eternal law. It's a violation of God's holy law. You've done something offensive to the deity. Now actually, righteousness is the opposite of that, right? Righteousness is, refers to judicial correctness. You have done what you were supposed to do. You kept the law. You're in right standing before God. And the word judgment here refers to what follows from a negative decision against you. Eternal punishment in hell is judgment against the one who sinned and did not have righteousness and therefore was judged. And the Spirit was coming to convict the world about these things. The Lord explains that more thoroughly here in verses 9 through 11. He says, concerning sin, because they do not believe me. That's where he says here in verse 9. Now think about it. The testimony of Christianity is that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of your sins are wiped away. By putting your faith, by looking to the Son of God, all of your sins are removed far away, as far as the east is from the west, never to be brought back to you. If you but believe and look up to Him, you will be forgiven forever. That's the message of the gospel. But the world, the religious establishment of Israel in this case, they had rejected that testimony. They rejected Him as Savior. And for that reason, their sin remained. They were, they were diagnosed as sinners and they were handed a cure and they rejected the cure but walked away with the diagnosis concerning sin because they do not believe in me. And that was not all. He also says that he was then going to convict them of righteousness. Verse 10, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. When he says here, you no longer see me, uh, he doesn't mean that the disciples would never see him again after his resurrection, because they would. He would appear to them uh, many times after he was risen. But rather, what he meant was, you no longer see me the way that you've been seeing me so far. Uh, they would not see him merely as the Galilean. The nobody, the son, of jo the son of Joseph that nobody cared for, the ragged, phony prince. They would not see him like that, no, but rather they would see him as the risen Lord, as the enthroned one. And they would even, they, the, the, the disciples would even preach him as such, as the risen Lord. They would declare him. To, uh, to be the righteous servant of God, the righteous servant whom Isaiah spoke of, the righteous servant, the one who upheld the divine law. And for that reason, for that reason because of his righteousness, death could not hold him down. And the Spirit, it says here, he was going to convict and convince the hearers of the apostles, the Jews in this case, that the Lord had been who he said he was. 
they were, they were going to get an inward sense that what they were hearing was true. And then also, he was going to convince them of judgment. Verse 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Uh, the, the word judgment uh, refers here to the legal process of judging. Jesus had claimed that he was going to be the one judging the living and the dead. He had claimed that even to the, to the Jews in uh, John chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, he says, For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. So Jesus will be the one to judge by the Father's own decree. He will have the scepter. He will decide. And He said here that the demonstration of that, the proof of the fact that He will have all judgment in the end, in the end, the last day, the proof of that is that the ruler of the world himself had been judged. The ruler of the world is Satan. And he rules, by the way, not because he does whatever he wants. He is God's devil. He only goes as far as God allows him to go. He doesn't do whatever he wants, but he does rule in the sense that he first tempted man to fall into sin. And beyond that... He continues to tempt men into sin. He, con he continues to create all sorts of temptations and false religions to keep men in bondage to their own transgressions and sins. But Jesus was saying here, He's been judged. He has been judged. The cross and the resurrection were a final judgment against Satan, because at that point, he is finally shown to be unable to prevail against the Almighty. Now think about that, before the resurrection, you might be, uh, say, a, a person who doesn't understand very much of biblical truth, and you might see good and evil, and you might say, well, which one's going to win? We don't really know. But Jesus rose again. Death could not hold him down, and so the devil was unable to destroy humanity. The very humanity that he wanted so hard, so bad to destroy, is not destroyed because Jesus makes atonement for them at the cross. And so, by rising from the grave, he exposes Satan as a failure. He is crushed. His head is crushed as the Proto-Evangelion had predicted in Genesis 3. So Satan was disarmed. He was publicly humiliated. Here you go. Here's an instance in which you might see even some, some irony in the story. And that when the devil who had tried so hard to kill Jesus succeeded, he actually accomplished his own undoing. And so he was publicly humiliated. When he finally killed Jesus, it was a blood atonement for the people of God to go free. And sure, he has been judged, but he still rolls or, uh, he prowls around like a roaring lion. Uh, Peter says that in 1 Peter 5 eight. He's still free in the world. He's still deceiving men and women. He's still proliferating false religion. But he is defeated. He has been conquered. He's like, he's like the, convic the convicted criminal who's already had his sentence passed down to him. He just hasn't made it to the jail yet. He's on the bus on the way to the jail. He's free in some sense, but he's convicted and judged. He's bound for jail. And the judge again who convicted him is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. So by defeating the devil, Christ demonstrated that he will himself stand as judge over the living and the dead. And his spirit was going to convict the world of that. Again, Jesus had proclaimed that to the leaders of Israel and they had rejected him. And here he is sending his spirit saying the spirit will make it clear to them. He will vindicate my name. They will know that I am the Messiah. They were going to know that they were in sin. 
Because they had rejected Jesus Christ. They were going to know that He is the righteous one of God by whom every man who would believe would receive a perfect standing before God. And He also was going to judge them on that last day. And they were going to have the guilt impressed upon their own hearts. That's what the Spirit was going to do. And it actually happened in Acts chapter 5, verse 37, when the Sanhedrin heard the gospel preached to them by the apostles, it says that when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. And then when they heard the preaching of Stephen, again, same thing in chapter 7, verse 54, it says that they were cut to the quick, cut to the heart, and they began gnashing their teeth at him because they knew this was the truth. They reacted violently because the Spirit was testifying to them inwardly, even as the apostles were delivering an, an outward message that they were hearing the truth. So our witness is always backed by an invisible work of the Spirit. He convinces the hearer that the hearer is hearing the truth. When you preach the gospel, something supernatural is occurring. Do you understand that? When you preach the Word of God, when you tell your neighbor, your relative, that Jesus is Lord and that He is a sinner deserving of death, something supernatural is taking place. The Spirit is actually convicting. He is working the conscience. Even if your hearer rejects you. Because the Word of God always accomplishes its purpose. You may be rejected, but you need to understand that our ministry is not one only of softening hearts. It is also one of hardening hearts. That was the, that was the job of Isaiah. Preach until you preach the whole city empty. That was his job. So all we are is messengers. Because we have a, a spiritual message. Beyond being triumphant and spiritual, our, wit our witness is sanctifying. Look at verse 12, sanctifying. I have many, things, uh, many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now, he said. And, and when he talks about many more things, it doesn't really mean fundamental things doctrines of the gospel, but rather what he means is applications of the gospel, like re realities like the hardening of Israel and the conversion of the Gentiles and the, and the, the abrogation, the cancellation of the ceremonial law. Those were truths that at this point the disciples, they just could not bear. The, the verb to bear, it means to take up in order to carry or to lift. It was used Figuratively, as we use it today, for the idea of both being able to understand something and to receive it calmly. There are a lot of biblical truths that are so opposed to fleshly thinking that we cannot bear them. That carnal people just cannot carry them, they cannot receive them. And in fact, even believers, if you think about it, believers, he's speaking to believers here. Some believers are so immature that they have trouble with some biblical truths. They find some things in the Bible difficult to bear. They may be too advanced for them or else too offensive. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-3, through 3, Paul said to the Corinthians that he had to speak to them as spiritual infants. He said, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as men of flesh. As to infants in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? And likewise, in uh, the book of Hebrews, in chapter 5, verses 11 and uh, 11 and on, the author of Hebrews says this, he says to the congregation, concerning this, he's speaking of Melchizedek, the priest king, concerning this, we have much to say to you, and it is hard to explain, because you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, since you, 
uh, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So notice the, the uh, Hebrew Christians, they, they, they were still stuck in, in the basic doctrines of the Christian religion. They needed to even be retaught the elementary principles of the Word of God. They, they still did not have a handle on fundamental gospel truth. So the deeper things of Christianity, like the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ, and how Melchizedek function, functioned as a type of Jesus, those were too advanced for them. They were beyond their ability to grasp. Now sometimes, again, immature believers are unable to receive some biblical truths, not just because they are too difficult to understand, but because they find them offensive. Because they've not learned to think biblically yet. Their thinking is too much like that of the world. In Matthew 19, just to give you an example, the disciples hear Jesus is teaching on divorce, and he says there, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits, commits adultery. This is verse 9. And they said, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. They were offended. They, they, they thought that Jesus' principle on marriage was way too lofty. And how did he respond? Well, he said... Not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it is given. In other words, it's not for carnal-minded people. The, 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 the disciples here, they needed to learn to think biblically. And in the same way, you might remember when Peter uh, first told, when he was first told that he should not eat foods uh, that were unclean, previously unclean. And he said to God himself, by no means, Lord, I'm not going to do that. In other words, he had been trained to think in one way, and when the commandment to do something else came, he even fought God himself. He had a hard time coming to terms with it. Some truths, again, they're, they're offensive to even Christians who are untrained, still fleshly. They're still in, the, in their infancy. And our Lord is telling here the apostles that, um, that they themselves still had things that they could not bear. But of course, the assumption in all of this is that one day, one day, they would grow into maturity. One day, they would embrace the very truths that they once found to be offensive. Do you want to know if you're mature in the faith? Do you believe things that you once thought were very offensive? So the gospel is a sanctifying message. It, it transforms the sinner's way of thinking. It causes you to think more and more after God's own thoughts rather than the world's thoughts, which is what we all come with by default because we are of this world until He brings us out of the world. Psalm 119, verse 20. The unfolding of your words give light, or gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. This is why when you meet, you meet a professing Christian who has been in church for years on end and still has not made any progress on biblical truth, you are probably talking to a false convert. Because the gospel is a sanctifying message. But beyond being a sanctifying message, it's also sufficient. It's a sufficient witness. And uh, look at uh, verses 13 through 15 here. Jesus says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of Mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore, I said that He takes of Mine and will disclose it to you. Uh, the verb that, that we translate here as to guide denotes the idea of helping someone understand something, uh, you grab someone by the hand and lead them. This is the verb that Jesus used of the Pharisees when He says they are blind guides or leaders of the blind. Let them alone. 
And it's also the, the verb that uh, the Ethiopian eunuch used in, his con in a conversation with Philip in Acts chapter 8, verse 31, when he said, How can I understand this passage, Isaiah 53, that is, unless someone guides me, un unless someone's, someone leads me through this text? The Lord is saying here, the spirit of truth, the author of truth, he is coming and he is going to lead or guide, or guide you to the apostles into all truth. Into all truth. What is all truth? All the truth. What is that? Well, all the truth that is necessary for life and godliness. This is why Peter says that in his divine word, we have. All that is necessary for life and godliness. Because they had put it all down. This was the apostolic message and they put it all down in the New Testament. All they needed to know about salvation. All they needed to know about worshiping God rightly. All they needed to know about living the way that we are supposed to live. All of that the gospel contains. That's what Jesus brought with him from heaven. And they... The apostles, they didn't have a full grasp of it yet, so he is promising that after his resurrection, the Spirit would come and would, would unfold what was in that gospel message that he brought. That's why in the next clause he says here, For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. The, the point, of course, of that phrase is not to diminish somehow the deity of the, of the Spirit, but rather it is to stress the fact that He doesn't work separately from the Father. When He comes, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, He doesn't work separately from the Son. And when He comes, He comes to reinforce, to testify to the message that Jesus Himself had brought. He is the Spirit of Christ. He guides Christ's people into all the truth that Christ brought with Him from Heaven, and he is going to show the apostles how Christ himself was going to be exalted. Notice uh, the last phrase of verse 18. He says, he'll disclose to you what is to come. The, the, the verb to disclose uh, here is, is often used with respect to unveiling hidden things. It was the same verb that the woman at the well used of the Messiah when she said, the Messiah will come and he will show us, he will unveil all things to us. And the Spirit here, He is saying to be doing the same thing, but He is even more specifically s s being said to dis disclose even what lies ahead. Uh, the, the exaltation of the Messiah and all prophecy, everything that comes ahead, the Spirit of truth He brings. This is why in Acts chapter 20, verse 23, Paul said that the Holy Spirit was testifying to Him that imprisonments and afflictions awaited him in every city. And in 1 Timothy 4.1 it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. And then in Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 it says that the visions concerning the future, what was to come, all of those were given to John in the Spirit. So the Spirit's, testi the, the Spirit's testimony, our testimony, our witness is prophetic. It even speaks with certainty about the end of the story. Not just the beginning and the middle, but also the end. It, it speaks with certainty about things to come. It speaks of Jesus as crown, King of kings and Lord of lords. And that's why in verses 14 and 15, the Lord said, He will glorify me, for He will take of mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Now, when, when he says here that he'll take what is his, that the Spirit will take what is Christ, he means the gospel that Jesus Christ himself brought with him from heaven, the Spirit's testimony was going to be all about that. It's not as though the Spirit deci decides that he's just going to write about Anything other than Jesus Christ and the exaltation of Jesus Christ because they are one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The work of the Spirit in the world is to exalt Jesus Christ as the only sufficient Savior. He holds Him up for all to see 
if they want to live. He is like John the Baptist who points a finger to Jesus Christ and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Believe in Him, look to Him, trust in Him. He is the Savior. And so He led us this is promised here, he did lead, lead the apostles into understanding the things of Christ. And so they remembered and understood the life of Jesus and they recorded that in the Gospels. He uh, reminded them of the mighty miracles that Jesus performed and what he said and they put that in the Gospels. And then he spoke to them and taught them about what the cross itself meant. And that comes in the epistles of the apostles. How the gospel impacts the life of the church. All of that is in the epistles. And then you have the book of Revelation, which speaks of the things to come. How Jesus will reign forever as King of kings and the Lord of lords. All of that comes because of the, the Spirit's testimony. He glorifies Jesus Christ. He makes much of Jesus Christ. Do you want to be like the Holy Spirit? Make much of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He even uh, makes the point here that, that uh, He is the, the way to the Father. The, the, the Spirit doesn't come to give people some, some sentimental experience. He doesn't come for that. It's not just to, to, to make people just feel a certain way, to give them a mystical sort of feeling. No, but rather he comes to make much of the second person of the Trinity, who is the way of the to the Father. Verse 15 says here, all that the Father has is the Son. So the Father made Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, to be the way to Him. He laid salvation entirely on Jesus Christ. You cannot come to the Father, but through Jesus Christ. And for that reason, the Spirit Himself makes much of Him. Because in Him, again, we have all that is necessary for life and godliness. The testimony that we receive from the Spirit in the Bible is sufficient. You don't need to go outside of it. John will repeat that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. He says, but the anointing and the Spirit that you received from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now, does that mean that there should be no teachers in the church? No, of course not. That would contradict everything else that the New Testament says, but rather, you don't need anyone to teach you anything that is outside of what God has put in His Word. You don't need these Gnostic teachers who are coming into the church, infiltrating the church, saying, Ah, but I have a secret knowledge for you. It's not in the Bible, but it is here. And I'm going to give it to you. In the same way the Muslims, uh, Muhammad comes and says, I have a new revelation. And I'm going to put it down in the Quran. And yes, the, the God of the Bible, yes, that God, but I have a new thing for you. The same way jo Joseph Smith came into the world and said, Ah, but I have the Book of Mormons that you have to append to your Bible. And he is saying, No. You do not need it. You do not need anything outside of this gospel. You do not need the psychologists. You do not need the supposed wisdom of this world. You need nothing outside of what is written. You don't need the experts. You, know, you don't need the religious gurus. You need the Word of God and the Word of God taught to you clearly because that is sufficient Amen. for all Praise God. Amen. Amen. that life requires. Amen. And we praise God for that. And that means that our message is worth dying for. Suffering things for. And, and saints throughout the ages have done that. They've died and bled for this gospel. And no one who ever suffered for Jesus Christ has ever lived to regret it. No one. Paul would tell you that. He was called to give his life for the gospel. And there he lay in a dungeon, a black dungeon, in chains, in a pit, 
waiting for his execution by a Roman governor or by a Roman emperor, Nero, waiting to have his head chopped off. And even there, at the end of his life, he said to Timothy this, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. He had preached it so much, he had suffered for that gospel so much, that it wasn't anybody else's gospel, it was his gospel. My gospel. For which I, sh I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But, the word of God, our testimony, is not bound. We said it is a triumphant testimony, it is not bound. And then he says, for this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we die with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. For He cannot deny Himself. Amen. Let's pray. You have given us a great gospel. Oh God. We are so unworthy of it. And yet we are so quick to turn from it, to seek to establish a righteousness of our own. We, we seek to earn your pleasure by even good works that we might do. We forget that our acceptance is in your Son. Oh God, help us to live in the light of that. We pray if there is anyone among us this morning that does not know Jesus Christ and has never embraced the gospel, I pray that this would be the day of that one's salvation. That, our, that this gospel would be treasured by all in this room, even the way that Paul treasured it, who suffered for it, because it is a saving gospel. It is an eternal gospel. A gospel that dates back, not even to the garden, but to eternity. And we remain your grateful people. So help us to live our lives as simply as thank you cards for you. In Christ's name, Amen. Amen.